Good morning. Welcome to our Investment Basics uh, breakout session. My name is Eugene Fistani. Um, Ginger Lamphere is my colleague. We're both financial advisors with uh, CUSA Financial Services at, and Credit Union. And today we're just going to discuss uh, some of the in investment basics. We'll talk about uh, some investment strategies, some of the asset classes that are used uh, as major components to most of our investment portfolios. And then towards the end, we'll open it up for a quick uh, Q&A session for about 15 minutes. Um, before we get started, quick show of hands, how many of you here invest? Perfect. And what does, what does the word invest mean to y'all? Absolutely, yep. That's one. What else? Absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, that's what we see, that's what we hear most from uh, most of our clients, uh, are just those two things. Most, uh, most folks who invest view investing as a, as a way to save for their future, but others may view it as a way to speculate in the market, take advantage of the market volatility, uh, of the ups and downs that the market may offer. In other words, to buy stock at a low price, sell it at a higher price, and turn a profit that way. Um, and others, as I mentioned, uh, view it more of a, as a savings type method. Uh, that's more of a methodical way to save for their longer term goals, whether it's uh, to buy a home, to you know, uh, finance college education, um, or if it's to save for longer term goals like their retirement and such. Um, so it's more of a combination of both. I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of three, two, three concepts that we'll touch on um, with investment fundamentals. Um, I think we all know what inflation is. Inflation is defined as a general increase in prices uh, over time. And it's a very important concept to, to understand and take into account when we talk about investing because you're going to want to take that uh, in consideration with the idea being that you want to outpace inflation over time. Um, inflation since, the, since 1914, according to uh, the U.S. Department of Labor, has increased by 3% annually. That means that $100 uh, today, if you buy something that costs $100 today, will cost you $181 20 years uh, from now. Stated a little bit differently, if you have $200,000 just stashed under your mattress, that's not doing anything for you. Uh, at a 3% annual inflation rate, that money in 20 years um, will only buy you about $108,000 and just below $60,000 in 40 years. So it erodes your purchasing power um, and it's very important to keep that in mind when you uh, construct your investment portfolio. As inflation has that uh, corroding effect, um, compounding has quite the opposite effect, right? It helps keep inflation in check. And that's what this uh, illustrates. If we have just, uh, if we save $5,000 uh, for 30 years without any growth whatsoever in it, after that time frame you'll have about $150,000 that you had saved. However, if we assume that we have a growth, annual growth rate of about 6% that's being compounded back into that portfolio, on that same time frame, you'll have about $395,291 uh, saved up. It's a huge difference, right? So keep that in mind uh, when we talk about investments. Rule of 72 is a quick way uh, for you to kind of figure out how long it'll take your investment to double in size, how many years it'll take for your investment to double in size. Uh, you basically take an estimated rate of return for your future investment. Um, and divide that into 72, and that gives you the approximate uh, time needed to double that investment in time. Sooner is better. And this is a, a huge, huge component uh, when it comes to investing, because we don't want to put off investing. If we do that, it's going to become much, much costly for us to pick it up uh, down the road, and it's not going to be as effective. So if we assume that we have $3,000 invested at the end of each year at 6% annual growth. By the time you reach uh, age 65, you will have compounded and accrued, uh, you'll have a balance of $679,000. If you put it off, though, only 15 years, and you don't start until age 35, 
you'll have about $254,400 in the same, if you invest in the same manner. And if you put it off until age 45, uh, you'll only have $120,000. So it becomes much more difficult to catch up uh, the later you start starting life. The other important factor here is that the younger you are, generally, the longer your time horizon and the higher the risk that you can take because you can essentially recover any potential losses that you may, you may incur uh, during market ups and downs. Any questions so far? When we start uh, talking about investing, one of the first things that we need to start thinking about is what it is that you're investing for. What are your investment goals? Some of us invest for retirement, others for education, for five to, you know, we establish 529 college savings plans. Uh, we may have a special purchase like a home or just in general financial security. This is important because it's going to determine you know, short-term versus long-term financial goals. And again, the longer the financial goal, uh, the longer your uh, time horizon, the more risk you can generally stand to take with the idea that you can recover those, those losses uh, down the road. So there are really two aspects of it uh, that we generally discuss. One is the personal uh, risk tolerance that a, an, an investor can take, depending on you know, how risky they are. The second one is how much flexibility the investment plan itself offers that, that investor. Right? Meaning, if, you have a, if you're buying a home, for instance, again, that's, that could be a long-term uh, investment goal, and it could take some time, that, and that offers you some flexibility along those lines. And that's just it, the ability to in, in, of the investment to, to absorb some losses the longer your time horizon or your personal risk tolerance. So a lot of times what we'll experience is even folks in their mid-20s or early 30s can't take any, they're very risk averse, so they, they do not tolerate high fluctuations uh, with market movements. And so they choose to have low risk, low risk investments. By and large, uh, these are the, the three uh, types of investment portfolios. Uh, conservative, which is someone that doesn't want to take a whole lot of risk in the market. Moderate and aggressive. There's a strict correlation between uh, risk and return. Generally speaking, the lower the risk, the lower the return, uh, and the lower the loss that you may incur. And conversely, the higher the risk, uh, the higher the potential return, but also the potential for loss. So a lot of folks may be a lot, com a lot more comfortable with investing, putting their money in CDs, which is just a savings uh, vehicle, uh, because they feel safe. However, the downside to that is that they're not going to keep pace with inflation. They're not going to experience higher growth. Versus uh, trading options or futures or common stocks, um, that risk level, that risk scale becomes much, much larger. Um, so they're taking on a lot more risk for much, much higher returns. Another important factor to think about is the risk-return trade-off. Um, as much as we'd like to have it all in, in one setting, it is practically impossible to accomplish that. Um, the further away we move from, from one of those components, uh, the closer we get to, an, to another one. So if, let's say if you're seeking growth in your portfolio, you're going to move, move more away from income or stability. Um, the trick is to find a comfortable place that's going to provide you both um, some growth without a lot of downside risk if you're more of a middle of the road approach type investor. So what are some of the investment types uh, that we generally use for most uh, portfolio compositions? One is, first one is cash, cash alternatives. You guys are all familiar with cash. Um, you have checking accounts, uh, CDs and such. The second one are bonds uh, that work much like IOUs. Um, third one are stocks. And we'll talk more about all those different asset classes in a bit here. Um, other investments uh, may include more advanced uh, investment strategies such as options trading, futures, uh, antiques, uh, real estate, uh, precious metals, and so forth. Uh, mutual funds are also great investments that uh, I'm sure you're all familiar, familiar with. We all hold those in our 401ks, IRAs, and so forth. One thing that we want to clarify, um, there's a 
misconception that we run into a lot is that 401k plans and IRAs are not considered investments. Uh, they're strictly tax privileged vehicles uh, that allow us to retire, uh, enable us to save money for retirement uh, generally. Um, but they do not, and they can hold either cash or investments within their, uh, within their those settings. So let's talk about cash and cash alternatives. Um, they're generally very low risk. Most cash accounts are insured by either the NCUA or the FDIC, and they have the full full faith and credit of the U.S. government. Uh, so they're virtually risk-free. Um, and they're used um, for their relative liquidity. So if folks need cash right away, it's easy to get to your, to your cash. Uh, you can walk into a branch, cash a check, and, and walk out of there. Examples of cash, of course, are CDs, certificates of deposit, which are time deposits, money market accounts, money market mutual funds, which were very similarly uh, as those uh, money market deposit accounts, U.S. Treasury bills. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of cash and cash equivalents? Well, they have predictable earnings. You go to a credit union or a bank, you open up a CD, they tell you they're going to pay you 2% over the next six months, at which point you'll get your principal and those returns back. They're highly liquid. Because again, we mentioned the fact that you can walk in at any time, you don't have to place a trade, liquidate that position, it's cash is available to you right away. And there's there's no risk to your principal. Again, these, these are insured by the NCUA or the FDIC, and they have the full faith and credit of the US government. Disadvantages, of course, is that returns are extremely low, especially in this current interest rate environment that we've been experiencing since 2008, 2009. And because of that reason, more than likely, they're not going to keep pace with inflation over longer periods of time. Bonds. If I could ask you all, what do you all think of, when you think of bonds, what do you think of? Actually, IOUs. So think of when any of us in here go to the credit union and apply for a loan. The roles in this case are reversed. We are here making a loan for either a corporation, for the U.S. Treasury, for municipalities, or whatever entity that's actually selling those, those bond issues, right? And they pay us back um, with with interest. So it's a loan to a government or a corporation. And it, it pays interest typically in intervals. Usually it's semi-annual. Um, denominations of bonds are generally $1,000 denominations. And they range anywhere between the year and 30 year durations. They can also be traded uh, like securities. Uh, if you, if you actually don't have to hold a bond to, to maturity if you're looking to trade it. Uh, you may or may not get uh, its full value trade depending on number of conditions, um, especially if interest rates, um, bonds and interest rates have an inverse relationship. So if interest rates go up, bond va values will generally tend to come down. And their value does fluctuate, again, depending on a number of different factors, both in the stock and bond market. Types of bonds, uh, we have U.S. government securities, uh, which again are treasuries. Uh, we have treasury bills, treasury notes, and uh, uh, treasury bonds. Uh, we have agency or uh, GSE government uh, entities, entity bonds, government-sponsored entities. These are uh, Ginnie Mae, uh, Fannie, Freddie Mac, and so forth. Municipal bonds that are issued by different municipalities for the same reason. Um, and then corporate bonds, again, same thing, corporations will issue these bonds to fund their, their operations, and then they'll pay back with, uh, with interest. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages uh, of, of, of bonds? The advantages, uh, you have a steady and predictable stream of income. They're going to pay a, a certain coupon rate when you first buy that bond. 
and you're expected to, uh, all, all else being equal, you're expected to get that, uh, that back, plus the principal once that, that bond issue actually comes due. Income is generally higher than cash and cash alternatives. If you're taking on now a little more risk, uh, you're paying a little bit of a risk premium when you go into bonds. Um, and they're, they're relatively low risk compared to, to stocks and other more aggressive investment options out in the stock market. There is some correlation with the stock market, uh, but not, so there's a low correlation there uh, between bonds and stocks. Disadvantages, one is the risk of default. So the corporation that, for instance, issues that, that bond issue could default, which means that you won't get your money back. Um, interest rates, uh, bonds are inherently interest rate sensitive. Again, as I mentioned, if interest rates move up, bond values uh, generally tend to come down. And what happens there is the fact that if interest rates do go up, let's say if we have an environment of 2% interest rates, interest rates go up to 3%, new bond issues are coming in the, in the market at the newer, higher interest rates. So investors are going to be more attracted to the new, higher coupon rates. So what that causes is a decrease in prices in the secondary bond market to make these bonds more available and more attractive to bond investors. And conversely, uh, as interest rates go down, bond values go up. Um, again, lower risk means lower potential returns um, than stocks or options or other more aggressive uh, investment options. Stocks. Um, again, I'll ask you guys, what, what do you guys think of stocks? What, what do stocks represent? Exactly right. Yep. Exactly right. Um, Stocks represent equity, shares of a company. So one of the ways that corporations, for instance, um, raise, raise money for their, for their operations is by selling a piece of their equity to the, to the public. And that, uh, so if, if I buy shares of uh, Facebook IPO when, when that uh, IPO went live, um, those shares represent proportionate ownership of, of me as an investor to, to Facebook. And that determines you know, both my, my gain if a company does, does well, or my loss if a company doesn't do as well as we anticipated. So percentage of ownership determines, again, share of profit or loss, depending on how that firm performs in the market. Um, earnings may be distributed by way of dividends. A lot of, a lot of companies uh, will pay out dividends, and that's one way that your, your stock will appreciate in value. Um, and shares of stock can also be sold for a gain in a secondary market. So of course, if you buy a stock at five bucks and turn around sell it at 10, that's how you make your, uh, your gain. Types of stocks, there's generally two types of stocks. Um, the most common are common stock versus preferred. Um, the main difference there is that common stock will allow uh, investors and shareholders, stockholders, to vote. It will give them voting rights uh, in that in that company, so they get a say on uh, on their board election and all these things that they need to, to run the company. But it does not. It, it puts them last in line for uh, for any rights. If the company, uh, for instance, goes bankrupt, they're last in line of creditors to collect their their money. Right. Whereas preferred. Uh, Stockholders don't have voting rights. What they do have though is they have preference over dividends and their their collection of their assets if a company is, uh, is being dissolved. Categories uh, of stock they're they ca they're categorized based on the, the size of the firm, right? So we have small cap, which stands for small capitalization, which is essentially uh, the number of outstanding shares in the market multiplied by the share price. And generally, small cap companies are anywhere between $200 million uh, to about, or I'm sorry, $300 million to about uh, $2 billion in size, market cap. Mid cap, same, same concept, um, slightly larger firms. Um, they range anywhere between $2 billion and $10 billion in, in, in market cap. Large cap corporations um, are much larger firms that uh, you know they go anywhere between 100 billion dollars 
on out. Uh, so here, think of Google, Facebook, and Microsoft, uh, firms like that. Generally speaking, small and mid-cap stocks are going to be more volatile. They're going to have more volatility. So your chances of getting higher returns exist, but so do your chances of actually losing value in those stocks. Large cap stocks, again, are going to be more, more stable. Uh, they'll still give you decent returns, but uh, in a more stable manner. Um, other stocks that, uh, that we work with are growth stocks. These are companies that have an orientation uh, for growth. They basically reinvest all their dividends um, and any capital gains back into their firms to, to generate aggressive growth. Uh, value stocks, these are stocks that trade at lower multiples uh, relative to, peer, to, to their peers and the market overall. So they have lower PE ratios, price to earnings ratios, book, uh, book ratios, and so forth. Income stocks, here we have uh, a lot of stocks, financials, and uh, utility stocks that pay dividends uh, to a lot of their, their stockholders. Blue chip, blue chip stocks are uh, large, pretty much large cap stocks or large firms uh, that, that are well established. And then worth mentioning also is um, ADRs, Amer American Depository Receipts. These are dollar denominated uh, foreign firms that can trade uh, domestically. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages uh, of stocks? Well, we talked about the fact that stocks have historically provided some of the highest returns relative to any other asset class in the market, both dating all the way back to the Great Depression. They give you some ownership rights, um, and they can also provide income through dividends and sometimes capital gains. They're relatively easy to buy and sell. As long as there's a market, you can buy and sell stocks. Um, and interact in the stock market. Disadvantages, of course, can be, we touched on this, poor company performance. It's going to impact uh, their dividend distribution uh, and the, the overall value of shares. They're subject to market volatility. Even if you have, if you own the most well-established stock, company stock, if the markets go down for whatever reason, more than likely it's going to feel that declining value of that particular stock that, that you um, there's, of course, greater risk to principle. It's not guaranteed. Um, and it's definitely not, not appropriate for short-term uh, short goals. So if you're thinking about buying a house six months from now, the last thing you want to do is go invest in the stock market and try to get some gains. Yep? What would you say about the um, Short-term, as it relates to your goals, right? So again, if you're looking to buy a house uh, six months from now, the last thing you want to do is day trade, right? Because you may or may not recover the value of those shares that, that you lose day trading. Day trading is highly speculative. Um, it does not base any of those that trade for the most part on any fundamental research. It's mainly technical research on the market, right? So, and most day traders, they may or may not know what they're trading. With. They just trade on volume. Um, so if, if your goal is to, again, let's say buy a house or finance your education and you're already in college, you can't take your college fund and uh, I guess you can do whatever. <laughs> um, it, it wouldn't be appropriate to, to, to use those funds that way. Because right? if, if you lose that value, that money's gone, you don't know how fast you're going to be able to recover that loss. So that's, that's what that does. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Other investments, of course, we kind of touched on this, are real estate, stock options, um, futures, and commodities, and then collectible items. But because this is a, an investing one-on-one -on -one class, we're not going to delve into any of those more complicated uh, strategies. Um, mutual funds. You guys know what, what a mutual fund is? It's basically it's a pool of investments that uh, enables investors to buy pieces of, of a lot of companies. Right? So investors pool their money and portfolio managers pool uh, either stocks or stocks and bonds or just bonds to construct a well-diversified portfolio of, of a mutual fund. Um, 
So think of, for instance, buying uh, Alphabet shares, which is the parent company of Google. They're trading at about 1,200 bucks a share, probably, uh, today even more. Um, if you have $1,200, you literally, you probably won't even be able to buy one share because you, you, you account for trading costs and all these things. However, $1,200 will get you a long way with a mutual fund because you can diversify that money. You can own upwards of hundreds, if not thousands, of different companies like Google, Microsoft, you know, whatever, whatever you, you're trading in. Um, plus, it's it's as you as you diversify, you also spread out the risk of all those firms. Right? The chances that those companies can collapse exist, but that they'll, they'll collapse all at the same time is is highly unlikely. Um, Perspectives will give you a lot of information about the mutual fund uh, that you may be thinking about investing in. It's going to talk about the fund's objectives, the risks, the charges, and expenses. Um, so make sure before you invest, you, you either consult a financial advisor or go through that perspectives to make sure that it, it's in line with your investment objectives and goals. Um, there's three major uh, investment categories in mutual funds, kind of like in stocks. Uh, so money market funds, bond funds, and stock funds. And of course they track the same, pretty much the same risk reward scale that we kind of saw uh, earlier. And again, the idea is that if you invest in a money market mutual fund, the share value is going to be a dollar per share versus investing in stock funds or international funds going to have more, more of an opportunity to grow your assets that way, but you're also going to take on a higher risk. Advantages, um, of course, diversification, professional management. So you have a team of uh, chartered financial analysts that do fundamental research on, in some cases, 300, 400 different companies. Um, so we're not throwing darts at the board when we're working with um, it allows you to invest in smaller dollar amounts instead of spending huge dollar amounts in individual securities. Uh, mutual funds, you can invest with as little as $100 or $250 and still maintain the same diversification that we just talked about. They are liquid, which is a great feature. Um, you own a portion of, of that mutual fund and you have liquidity of, of shares. You place a trade with your your broker or the fund family that you do business with, cash will become available post settlement. Disadvantages is that value shares, of course, as we've been discussing with, with any investments, can and does fluctuate daily. A portion of your dollars, of your assets, may be allocated to just cash within that mutual fund. And the reason for that is that the portfolio manager has to take into account that there are going to there are going to be liquidation requests coming in from shareholders, so they need to have cash available. But as well, they use a lot of cash for buying opportunities. Uh, and so that's the reason why some of that, some of your assets may be tied in cash. Um, potentially, is tax inefficient, as it may relate to your specific tax position. And the reason for that is that the fund manager has a mandate, and they will distribute any gains uh, from the fund straight to its uh, shareholders. They don't necessarily care too much about your specific tax position. So if you're in a high tax bracket, again, that's a consultation you should have with your uh, tax advisor or your financial advisor. And of course, there are mutual fund fees and expenses. Um, Express as an, uh, as an expense ratio. Uh, and that's just for the research, the trading that goes in the fund, and just managing the overall uh, assets of that portfolio. Exchange traded funds, um, anyone know what exchange traded funds are? So exchange traded funds combine the benefits of diversification of a mutual fund. In other words, you're usually uh, diversified and you own, let's say, the S&P 500, but they will also allow you to trade intraday based on bid and ask. So they trade like stocks, whereas mutual funds trade only once a day at the close of market. So they become, uh, they become much more uh, cost efficient and they've become extremely popular in recent years. So there's trillions of dollars that are traded in, in ETF 
US markets. Uh, because they're based on an index, there's not a lot of active management that goes in with these uh, investment vehicles. And so they also have a really low cost of owning uh, these vehicles. Passive management, um, and they can be traded uh, throughout the day. So you can literally trade any index uh, like a stock. These are also uh, tax efficient because, again, they, they do not trade actively from within the ETF, so they don't generate a whole lot of uh, capital gains or dividends or anything like that. Same thing here. If you look for investing, look at uh, the prospectus. Dollar cost averaging. Anyone want to know what dollar cost averaging is? An idea? It's a very simple yet powerful investment tool that essentially enables us to invest a set dollar amount uh, periodically over up markets and down markets. And so what that does is it, it effectively lowers the average cost per share. So in this example, for instance, we're investing $500 each month uh, when the markets are up and the markets are down. And as you'll see, the average market price per share ends up being $20 per share, but the investor's average cost per share is $17.24. And as time goes on, this activity replicates, uh, it, it, it's extremely cost efficient. It's no different than what we all do with our 401ks. Uh, if you have a set dollar amount that comes right out of the paycheck, it is invested uh, periodically. Diverse asset allocation, extremely important. Um, with asset allocation, the idea is that we want a variety of different asset classes within a portfolio. That includes large cap stocks, uh, small to mid cap stocks, growth stocks, value stocks, um, some bonds, uh, both treasuries, corporate bonds, junk bonds, but they all have to be in the right percentage allocations based on your age, your risk tolerance, and your investment uh, time horizon. This is important because different asset classes will react differently to market ups and downs. That they will react differently to certain news uh, that, that come out. And so it's important to take advantage uh, of that diversity of asset classes. This is sample allocation, uh, which is a conservative, um, may or may not be appropriate uh, for you, depending on what stage in your financial life you're at. Uh, this is comprised of 50% bonds, about 25% stocks, 25% cash. And you'll see as we go through this, the more aggressive ones will have more stock exposure. This is more of a moderate, middle of the road approach portfolio that has about 50% stock allocation, 40% bond, 10% cash and cash alternatives. Um, and then a more aggressive one with 75% stock, 15% bonds, and 10% cash and cash alternatives. Um, within those, uh, from within each of those components, then you gotta make sure that you have the right allocation of, again, as I said, small to mid to large cap uh, stocks, different, uh, different kinds of stocks. And bonds. Financial advisor can help you work, you know, to determine your, your long-term financial goals. Can help you determine that asset allocation. There's also a ton of uh, calculators online that you can also use to determine your asset asset allocation uh, portfolio creation. Um, but yeah, so there's all sorts of uh, tools out there to help you guys out. That's. Oh, I have. <laughs>